Hello everyone and welcome to the Kesh Plasma Reactor Group. Once again, it's Tuesday night. It's always Tuesday night at Kesh Plasma Reactor Group. And it's July 25th, in this case, 2015. Okay, so, as usual, um, we have a bunch of people here that are anxious to show things and explain things and question things and so on. So let's just dive in and see what we have lined up for today. Um, I notice uh, Lee Coates is here. Do you have anything you would like to present off the bat today, Lee? I got nothing new to pre present, really. Uh, if John shows up, I'd like to talk about. If John, sorry, if John shows up, I was just putting my headphones on. John, John, that's. Really? Hmm. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> hmm. Maybe you have to apply a strong magrav field first and disable all the computer chips and start from there. Maybe they're all counteracting each other. Who knows, eh? Uh, oh yeah, a little s sort of tiny one, or In the newer cars, it uh, doesn't seem to be working at all. So, Speaking of not working, I, I didn't have my audio on the live stream while you were expounding about that. But just to recap, basically, you, you were, um, um, were testing different units and were finding various results, I guess, depending on... Uh, on application and found that the ones with the computer chips weren't working so well but the maggrav yeah. units and the older the car, vehicles car, were cars working with real computer good. chips in them right that can, yeah, that's that control the fuel flows right someone people have mentioned that before because we do have the automatic adjusting systems in all the new vehicles with fuel injection where if you're uh, air supply or fuel supply is restricted in some way it will try to compensate in any, any way it can to to balance out the air fuel ratios again so yeah, I, I, I was just doing a basement renovation for a mechanic and uh, got to chat with him about computers and stuff and of course mechanics won't don't want to touch anything to do with the computer system maybe other than replace the sensor but uh, yeah, so it's, it's they don't like to. Me any advice. <laughs> yeah, generally mechanics won't be dabbling with the computer system. They will be getting the information out of the computer quite often nowadays, and and using that information to make a diagnosis and that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, they don't like to play with the computer because it's usually worth a thousand to two thousand dollars and. Uh, one wrong move with static electricity and you've zapped the computer and your your uh, either your car or your customer's car will be dead dead in the water <laughs> as yeah, they well, say I, yeah i was thinking is there some way to by uh, bypass the sensor or you know or you yeah. know maybe 
maybe uh, you know block some airflow to uh, the airflow sensor or something like that <laughs> absolutely you can do that um, there's there's people that uh, put in resistors in the circuit with the uh, airflow or air fuel sensor which is sometimes called an oxygen sensor but the oxygen sensor is actually downstream and the air fuel uh, sensor is an upstream one and they look the same but they they can be fooled in essence to give you uh, to bypass the system people that put in high performance uh, uh, injectors and other parts will sometimes try to bypass the system so they can uh, dial in their engine to get more power and and uh, they don't care about the extra air pollution or whatever else fuel mileage yeah. and that sort of thing doesn't matter this so mechanic I was talking to was saying you can actually get your vehicle chipped as well he said chip there's various chips you can get installed by the dealer to and you know improve fuel mileage and various other things but it costs about six thousand dollars to get your your vehicle chipped so it's rarer than anybody does it <laughs> well yeah you, you can buy chips for in the hundreds of dollars up to the thousands of dollars yeah um, but generally uh, that will be for a different purpose although some people now um, have been doing the HHO thing, hydrogen oxygen combination, or just straight hydrogen, and injecting that into engines. And uh, apparently, that can uh, um, alter the the fuel system. You can make it uh, um, appear too rich or lean, and then the system has to compensate. So it ends up you might not save the uh, the fuel savings that you would have in the older vehicles uh, that didn't have all the fancy computer equipment and so on but you can there are ways you can bypass that to to sort of disable it or partially disable it for certain purposes <clears throat> so as, as the, uh, the cash foundation store had problems with air car units or that you've heard of not that I know of. I haven't gotten too many reports in the testimonials about the car units. There's quite a few reports of uh, people's own own uh, homemade units, and um, most people are, in fact, everyone that I remember has been quite enthusiastic about their their car units and whatnot. And there's quite a few testimonials in the Golden Age of Gans and some of the other Facebook posts and whatnot as well. Um, but, um, yeah, if people out there do have some sort of report on the uh, official Cash Foundation car MagGrav unit or the house MagGrav unit, if you can get a hold of me somehow, I can put it into the, the testimonial site of the Cash Foundation. So, and you should be able to get a hold of me in the usual ways with either Rick Crammond or through the, through the Cash Foundation or other ways. And I'm more or less a public name now so you can find me. <laughs> um, yeah, it, anybody else have any feedback uh, about that from their experience? Well, that's all I got, Ben Rick, for tonight. Okay, thank you, Lee. Okay, who would like to grab the spotlight next here? That's your big opportunity. I'll uh, I'll go ahead and talk about the the deuterium GANs real quick. All right, great, thank you. If you don't mind, um, if you could so, just say who you are and and where you're from, there, David. Yeah, uh, David uh, from uh, Arizona. Um, thank you. I had been on uh, one of the previous workshops or uh, plasma reactor groups and had mentioned that I'd been working with the deuterium GANs and during one of the experiences I had uh, with it rotating. So it was basically rotating um, the deuterium GANs being in the presence of it and just observing um, in a non-thought sort of meditative state the um, field around the unit that I had uh, perceived what from my past experiences, I would describe as possibly the beginning stages of a vision, meaning that the um, 
field of view, my entire field of view essentially was taken up by a um, transparent overlay of uh, white light. And the white light had a pattern to it. And it was kind of bouncing between, I don't know, somewhere between a couple of percent uh, transparency up to maybe seven, eight, ten percent, somewhere in that range. But it kind of would fade in, fade out, fade in, and fade out. But as it got stronger, when it got to the stronger uh, levels of it, to me, it looked like I was looking at structures, different structures, like maybe a table, a sofa. I can't say 100%, but it felt very much like I was looking into another uh, room at another location is what it looked like to me. So, But when I've seen visions through meditation, sometimes it will start like that. They will kind of build from a more, um, I'm trying to think of the word, from kind of like a shadowy kind of uh, perspective to a stronger, sharper perspective. And it felt very much like that was sort of uh, possibly what was occurring. The other possibility would be you know, he's talked, Kesh has talked about teleportation. Sure. Could have been the early stages of teleportation, like physical teleportation, or it could have just been more like consciousness teleportation. But I had to say that as a recap real quick, because the real, that was in another workshop that I talked about this. Um, but uh, the thing I want to update is um, I had given some of this deuterium GANs to a friend and uh, I believe his experience kind of aligns with what I just described in terms of my experience. Um, but basically, he was holding the GANs, the deuterium GANs in his hand. He was uh, using his other hand to uh, pull energy from the environment and push it into his chest kind of repeatedly as he was walking around the house. And in tandem to this, he was uh, talking to his girlfriend on the phone. And his girlfriend lives in another st in another state, and um, he's been there, you know, several times. But he's not overly familiar with the area. Um, but he was talking to her, and so they're having this conversation. And at one point, she had to, she's running around town doing some stuff, and there was going to be a long pause. And he's like, "Oh, that's fine, no problem. I'll just hold on the line." So he's he's doing that activity while he's holding. He's more focused on the deuterium gans in his hand and, and pumping energy into his chest. He's just kind of walking around the house waiting for something, you know, for her, her to come back on the phone. And all of a sudden, he starts to see very clearly uh, in his mind's eye a woman uh, and her, like her face, like really clear. And then it kind of disappears and then it kind of reappears and disappears and reappears. But every time it appears, it's very clear. And he said it, it happened over maybe, I think he said like a couple of minute uh, period of time, like every second or two, it would pop in and pop out. So it was very uh, persistent. And when he saw the woman's face, he was like, I, I, I know this woman, but I can't place where I've seen her before. And then he, at some point during that process, he said he started to smell this really overwhelmingly powerful aroma. And um, he's somebody who doesn't eat sweets. Uh, he hasn't eaten sweets for like decades. But he's somewhat familiar with them. He's not like an expert with uh, sweet smells. And this, this was a sweet smell. And he was like, man, I, I, this, this smell is kind of familiar, but I can't place it. And it's really powerful, really overwhelming. And as this is happening, um, at some point, probably within a minute or, or two, I'm not really sure, his girlfriend, um, who's in transit somewhere, um, starts to have a conversation with another, with another woman. And he realizes, oh, wait, that's her friend. And then he realizes, oh, that, that's the friend. That's the friend that he may have only interacted with briefly because his girlfriend lives in, an, in another state. So he probably hasn't had much opportunity to, to be around this, this friend of hers. But basically, he immediately remembered, oh, that's that's the friend of hers, the, the face that I'm seeing. And then the, the girl uh, says to his girlfriend, here, take these brownies. And he's like, oh, my God, that's it. The brownie smell is what I've been smelling. Um, and he said that um, after a couple minutes, but he said the brownie smell stayed, the aroma stayed with him for hours. And it was really strong. So to me, that is in alignment with some of my experiences, but it didn't quite go to the same level. It was to, for me, when I was having the experience, I felt like the field effect was not coherent enough or stable enough to manifest in a, in a strong enough way um, to, 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 to quite go to that level that he experienced. But 
I thought it was very interesting, so I just thought I would share that information. All right, thank you, David. That's uh, good to see that sort of perspective. Anything else you um, you have from that end? Oh, what about the uh, your secret formula for deuterium GANS, by the way? <laughs> well, the GANS was given to me by a friend to work with, so um, I would just follow what's already been instructed through the workshops. It uh, okay. The substance uh, is like a black, uh, very black, oily, very oily kind of substance. Oily, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, can anyone here remind me what the process is for making deuterium GANS? Um, it's my understanding is you use CH3, you set up a CH3 kit, a standard kit. You use power uh, with the kit. You take the power to a higher level than normal to push it from an orange color GANS to more of a black color GANS. Now there's uh, from what I recall in the workshop, John, or let me try to think, because John and Armin were talking. So Armin, I believe, said that you should put the positive lead to the chicken wire and the negative lead to the, oh wait, I'm sorry, hold on. No, it's the other way around. The negative lead to the chicken wire and the positive lead to the um, nano-coated uh, copper plate. Um, I know of other people who've done it the opposite, so I, I, I'm just saying Armin suggested that that way. Other people might do it a different way. So, But basically, it's just a CH3 kit with more power to it to where you get more of a black material, is my understanding, um, forming in the kit. Okay. Can anyone else add to that? Uh, what about using... Do, you're supposed to bubble any oxygen in or other um, plates involved or technique or anything special that anyone can remember. From what I remember, Rick David has described it pretty good. Okay. I've I've tried that, in, you know, about six months ago and got some black ants, but I, uh, I did at that time I didn't realize it was deuterium. So <laughs> I didn't at that know time. There. You didn't realize you you had spaceship reactor material there for. Uh, That's for right. I was just trying to make CH3 with power. <laughs> and I ended up with something black. <laughs> you didn't realize it was your ticket off the planet, eh? <laughs> and I haven't tried to repeat it here this month, but uh, that's on my list of things to do. <laughs> yes, right. We have strange lists of things to do when we're involved with the Cash Foundation. You know, to must make deuterium GANs, you know, uh, etc. All right, well, that was interesting. Um, anything else about that, or shall we move on to uh, perhaps Mark? Or if someone else has something they'd like to say or present? Okay, so how about it, Mark? You got anything going on today? Is it too early for you? You see, I, 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 I don't know if what I should do because I know we're supposed to be in a stand down mode. <laughs> well. but, but you know how hard that has been <coughs> somebody like myself? <laughs> <laughs> well, you just have to, uh, you just have to approach it differently and use different words and, and throw in peace every once in a while, and then everything will be fine. Well, that was, I believe that was our very first intention, and I'm sure that, you know, we have to keep going back to that. You know, because new people keep on coming into the program here and we have to our 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 whole mission our whole mission statement is peace 
and if we, if the fir very first steps of these projects were we talked about the hope for peace was presented to us before these materials and all these ideas, the hope of a peaceful way of introducing things to people that we can give things to them instead of having to fight for them or, or uh, be hated for having them. If we could all be, e you know, if some of these technologies could make us more equal, it would equal peace. And before that we can achieve peace, we had to learn what peace was before we could learn what these technologies could do for us. They could provide some, th I think they can provide some things for us. This is just my analogy of the last couple of years. And um, it's hard, you know, you have to, there's a lot of deciphering that you have to do when you listen to these things. But I think for myself, when it gets right down to the nitty gritty, um, when the rubber meets the uh, pavement, um, you got to, we got, you hit, we, people that put their, not money, but their time and effort in showing that um, peace is, is a part of it because you're, re, you're replacing your, your efforts by doing this instead of doing the other things that you used to do that didn't benefit people watching TV, going uh, to the bar. I mean, that's, that's, that's not, that's self-serving in a way. And that's fine. And, and this, but this was a way to kind of allow us to be, interact more broadly, I think, with more people in a peaceful way. <laughs> so yeah, I like, absolutely. I agree. This was part of the whole deal right from the very get-go. If you listen to, you know, some of the very first teachings, I mean, Caroline, I mean, I, I can tell you a story and I still adhere to it today is um, one of the very first things I remember to be connected to anything we do, be part of it. I still, you know, when I need a batch of salt to put, to start to make my gans, I put my feet in the water, in the hot water and I am now connected. She said that was a great way to connect your soul to the water, and and here we go from there. And I still adhere to some of these things, and you know these are just small. And it's it's so peaceful to have your feet in hot water with salt, and you feel so good. And it's relaxing, and what a great way to just either start the day or end the day. I mean, really. <laughs> have you ever wondered that maybe she meant the soul of your what? Not your soul? <laughs> I wonder sometimes. Yes. No, it's, so, I'm, you know, I'm sure so that was... Use are double entendres. Yeah, true. Sometimes in the higher levels, that's the way it goes. Things get really ironic really quickly with names and things flip around and whatnot. So anything can work that way. But yes, you've, you've taken that to heart and uh, heart and soul, so to speak, and uh, have used that as your primary technique, I guess, uh, all the way along. Is that true? Absolutely. It's been a guideline now for me. I mean, I was always, I always you know, I, for conversation's sake, you know, people would ask me, I, you know, I live in Detroit, Michigan. That's where I reside. It's, it's pretty it's pretty violent you know by nature I guess you hear the stories but it, to me I don't feel threatened but people ask me oh do you have a gun and I say no why would I spend my money on a gun and bullets and they say well you live in Detroit you should always everybody should have a gun well, yeah and, yeah and just... say, well, well if I had a gun then I'd have to use it and if I had to use it, that means I'd have to shoot somebody. And I'd, that would be, in my idea of live a life, to shoot somebody with a gun with my money, it just doesn't make sense to me at all. And to try to tell people that here in Detroit, they think I'm ludicrous. They think I'm crazy. <laughs> we got five. I got five guns. I carry three. I, got, I, got, I carry oh, three, God. yeah. Yeah, well... well that's right, uh, I, and they just had the, uh, I think a couple of days ago, they had the 
was it 50 year celebration of the riots of uh, 1967 yeah. in Detroit when everything burned and I was in Flint in 1970 what would it be well roughly eight or ten years eight and ten years later from that and it was pretty violent then I remember uh, there was some kind of shootout between the local bike biker biker gang and the police <laughs> and uh, and this kind of thing was going on. Uh, students would get sort of uh, assaulted on just walking down the street, and and this all the rumors that I would hear as a as an engineering student back then in in Flint. Yeah, so I mean, it's come a long ways in a way, and it's it's. Uh, well, there's a lot a, there's actually they're they're having a story come out, and they I don't want to say they glorify the fact of you know the fighting and all that but it, they make up the movie of it people are going to pay money to hear but, but the sad part about it is is that the true people that reported on the at the time when the actual uh, riots happened some of the real reporters here local reporters went back to these old timers and said and had a, and had a talk with them and one guy struck me so dear he said we stood in these corners reporting this ugliness, and 50 years later, I'm still standing at the same, on the same exact corner, and they put picture to picture, side by side. Here he was, a young man, and here he is, an old man, and the, you know, and it still looked the same. The blight, 50 years later, and he said, and like he said, people say that we've come a long way. Well, we're, we're you know, a long way from what? Or a long way to where. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, he said, if it was my hope, at least we can at least achieve, you know, to clean up our city to this point. You know, we still have buildings that, if you really dug deep, they're still the burned out buildings from the time of the riots. Mm -hmm. People yeah. will not go in those areas. They're very dangerous. You do not want to go in those areas where those riots first started. It's still the same way. I mean, it's very dangerous. And and I pray for people that have this. There's people that have to live there. They have no choice. So I thought, and that was another thing I thought when I started this technology, because um, we talked about making little love energy balls. And I thought, well, man, what would a great thing what I could do to make a, a, a little energy, a peaceful energy ball and give it to, because we have a lot of problems at gas stations. And I thought, what a great thing. They wouldn't even know it. I could just toss it up on top of the roof and just, have love energy ball on top of these these crepid gas stations in Detroit and everybody that goes there uh, picks up the love and then you know we do have discussed we have to ask the people for their permission to share the love it's a you just don't throw things about the universe it's just don't do that that's not the right thing to do just you know I was don't pour Gantz water in the water just because you you think that's the right thing to do. If you if you approach it in a peaceful way and you prepared your Gantz water for a peaceful uh, application to water, then you will find that it'll be a little bit more applicable for the environment to, to say you, you're saying thank you to already what it already has. Where instead of sitting there going like I'm going to heal you by making my Gantz. And nature goes like, eh, I've already made the gas and I'm giving it to you. <laughs> Who's healing who? Who's healing who there, big guy? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we were just little babes in a big woods. So, for me, you know, I, I've i stayed, I've tried to keep my, I've made some things, some health things, and i gave them out and it really felt good. But I had a little project that I was so close to completing that it was just a few more steps and I didn't really uh, make anything new or build anything or I just kind of put some uh, ganses. I just filled, I just filled some ganses up and I just, uh, I just connected some wires really all into this. So I don't know how that, how that applies. If I overwent, overreached my boundary, but it was just 
I never made a complete mag grab. Everybody has mag grabs, small ones that are attached to this or attached to that, but I went for the bigger picture. And I, my brain was so out on my huge unit that I never really got around to making a, just a three stacker unit. Never did it. And I was so close to completing it when, it, when Mr. Kesh said, could you sit back for a month? I'm going like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> so yeah. then when John and everybody started saying, well, you know, uh, and then I listened to uh, that one session with uh, 10 p.m., uh, day 10, p.m. 10, where Mr. Cash talked about, you know, these reactors are definitely something that can aid us in a, in a peaceful way. It can, I'm sure he doesn't want to say they can probably hurt us, too, in a, in a harmful way of if people, you know, get together and start pouring, you know, negative energy into them, because these are just probably more than more than likely just sending and receiving um, units. And if you work with them long enough, certain things are going to manifest from them. And that, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get tritium and deuterium, and you know, we're trying to sep sep separate elements from ele you know, from different elements to to, to go to a higher level. So I'm sure that, you know, in everything and in everything in life, there's a minuses and positive and minuses. And I'm sure the dark forces are, are just as going to always be on your tail. If you're going to be a good guy, you're going to always feel like there's going to be somebody that's, you know, coming, nipping at your heels because, I, you know, because they don't like... For some reason, unless we, hopefully someday we'll we'll be able to not to have to have that feeling of somebody nipping at our heels, if if that makes sense. Well, maybe the the new way of going is we just go positive and don't worry about the nippers, basically. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's it's a matter of um, what can what can withstand a field of say unconditional love or or that sort of um, uh, principal plasma kind of field um, all you can do is put up a, a plasma field to be able to withstand it or to exist in that structure in that environment so in that case you're still under the influence of these plasmatic fields and if if one is under that influence, then maybe one can't be, maybe one is not able to um, uh, use it in a harmful manner. Maybe it just automatically is uh, compensating, you might say. Just like, or, or you could look at it in this way, um, the deuterium, as you're making the deuterium, and it becomes your outer part of the, the harder part of your shell, which would be your exterior, wherever that, wherever you place that exterior of yourself, that can be un, impenetrable. You don't have to worry about people penetrating your yourself anymore. With pop, you know, with negative, it's yourself. You're, we're trying. You know, just think about if you created something for yourself and the deuterium is as strong as diamonds and you're inside it, you're part of that structure, you're inside that structure and that's your craft, man, would you feel protected? Would you feel wonderful? Would you feel personally empowered? I think so. Because this way... I don't, I don't see how you, you know, maybe that's why he wants us to, to have control of our souls, because once you have control of your own personal soul, then you, you can go from there. Because, like I said, if you're not in control of yourself, and you, you can, you could, think bad things, I think, could happen to you, you know, greedy things and all kinds of things. And that's what you don't want to have happen. And I... I, I can understand where Mr. Cash comes from. So that's a big leap for all, this whole foundation. If people start thinking that, you know, well, if I do this, I'm the next step is the golden 
uh, roads of paved of gold, and I'm making them for myself and not sharing them with anybody else. I'm the king of my own castle. Man. Yes, but that's uh, precisely when things start to collapse in that um, uh, mindset, and that's yeah. why um, the 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 uh, what do you call it the, uh, the the plasma fields. Uh, in order to feel the fields and actually interact and so on, uh, one can't come from a place of the physicality. One has to come from a place of the the essence-based um, form, the essence-based perspective. Otherwise, there's no, you have no way to control the situation, you have no interaction. So in other words, it takes an open heart to interact with the love energy, otherwise there's no such thing really in those realms as hate energy. There's only love energy or absence of love energy because there's no duality really from that positive perspective moving forward positively from this moment to the next moment to the next moment and so on. There's no room for uh, any negative stuff. So it's just the field of positivity moving forward. The same as in a, if a, with a spaceship and uh, how it's explained how the fields have to push forward many kilometers, uh, maybe hundreds of kilometers ahead of the spaceship as it moves through space. I, I uh, have something here that I don't know if this will help or not. Um, uh, I had had an experience where essentially I linked up with God and in that moment, and I had the, the white, uh, I believe based on what Kesha has described in terms of your soul expanding and seeing white light, I had that experience of surrounded by the field. So if that was indeed my soul, uh, that I was in the, the physicality of myself was inside my soul in that moment, um, all the cells of my body uh, became unified. Now, previous to that, I had been pumping energy into my body and, and I'm going to make a correlation here with the planet in terms of what Kesha is trying to do in my opinion. But um, as I was pumping energy into my body, I reached a certain threshold where the rest of the cells, so at first it was sort of like a concentration in the chest, and then at a certain point it kind of tipped and all the cells kind of uh, flipped over, so to speak. It's, it's almost like the, the, the uh, intensity of the energy was so much that they couldn't, they could resist, I suppose, but they didn't really want to resist. And then at that point is when the, field expanded outward, the white light around me, this kind of thing. I can get into more details. I'm trying to keep it kind of short and get to the point that ties in with Mark. Um, so, but in that moment, when God approached me, I was in a, it was because in my opinion, the cells of my body were more in harmony with each other in a state that is normally not, that normally I'm disharmonious. The cells of my body are dis they, they, they're completely ignorant of the other cells around them. They don't, they're disconnected. They don't understand that they're part of a collective, the human body of me. And in that moment, they were all linked up. They understood that they were part of this totality of the human body, me. And uh, I believe the universe is the same kind of thing. So um, in that moment, um, when I was in that state, when I was in that field, that bubble, we'll call it, uh, we'll assume it's the soul. And I was inside my own spaceship. I had no pain. I had no hunger. Uh, I was more in the moment. Uh, I felt uh, love beyond what I can uh, describe. It's far beyond what a human being is capable of from God in that moment, in that field. Uh, let me ask you quickly while you have that memory. Do you have any memory of having to put up any shielding or buffers? Or was it more like you could just absorb any what we normally would call negativity or other influences from the outside did you have to buffer against that did you have to put up your shields or was it sort of the uh, unconditional love could just absorb that and and let it pass through more or less i'm trying to it, establish uh, sort of this two ways of dealing with things in in that moment such a thing doesn't exist 
the the idea of negativity and harm and all i mean you're that that is not even in your awareness you're just in the in that moment i was in the field of unconditional love uh nothing else mattered um it was irrelevant um but uh go, going back to the point real quick in terms of like i didn't have any pain i i didn't i wasn't hungry you know the kinds of things that we talk about these technology being able to do if I had desired to maybe manifest something, maybe it's possible I could have manifested something, even though that was not my desire at the moment. I'm saying that you need, I'm trying to try it, tie it back to what you're saying, Mark. My perspective is that it's possible in order to achieve the miracle level crazy stuff that is talked about using the physicality approach of the materials. When you build a coherent field that's strong enough to get those effects, you may not be able to, um, do any harm with it because it may be tied in uh, with the totality in a way that's more harmonious. Meaning, if it's disconnected, you can't get the effect you want. If it's connected, you get the effect you want. But because it's part of the totality, it's more in harmony with everything. You you can't really do anything wrong with it. You either get one or the other. You get no uh, you either get no result or you get the result you want. But it's linked in in a way that's not going to be harmful. The other point, real quick, I want to make. Uh, and then I can stop talking is that in my opinion, what I experienced with my body, all the cells, uh, again, I was, uh, doing a meditative walk. I was, uh, to, to trigger this, I was doing a meditative walk, pumping energy into my chest, building the energy, building the energy. And at the same time, holding non-thought, these were the three things that I was doing, uh, that triggered the, the effect. Um, as I said, the threshold of cells got to a point in my body where, it was very concentrated at first in my chest, and then it started to spread out very rapidly. I believe the same thing will happen with the planet if each individual works on themselves as if the planet, uh, we are all cells in the body of the planet. If you get enough of a threshold of people that operate in this manner, it will flip the totality of the planet in terms of the population. Now, the population that doesn't want to experience it, let's say the very evil people, they cannot they, if they don't want to participate, they don't have to, but the field effect will be so overwhelming to them that it's probably going to be impossible for them. They're not going to be able to ignore it. Let's put it that way. They're going to feel it and uh, they can choose not to participate, but it will be so potent. Uh, I, would be, I would be surprised if they could, they could stand against it. Yeah, if everyone else is running around with a smile on their face and they aren't, they're, they're not going to feel so good about themselves, probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if Caroline has her way, then we're all going to be looking in the mirror and uh, smiling. So this is the new mode, mode of operation, it seems, for humans. Did that make any sense, Mark, or did that help, or did I just confuse you? Or You helped to confuse me. Okay, no problem. Sorry, bud. No. <laughs> Is there no, we're, any... we're on the same lines. I I think we're we're all on on that path. Um, everybody else, you know, goes in a different way. But but, but I'd like to say thank you because um, uh, just another confirmation that some of these materials are definitely going to come in handy for us to work with. Because we're, as humans, I think we're still hands-on. And, you know, as we move away from, you know, we definitely will move away from these material things because it's just, it'll be a natural progression. I mean, look what we're making here now. We wouldn't have made these things five years ago. And we're, we're almost done with these. You know, we're, these are at the end of the line. Like Mr. Cash said, they're, you know, some, for some people, they still look at it like, uh, wow, that's pretty weird looking, but. To us, it's like, oh, that's no big deal. We got a couple of coils here and a capacitor there and a, you know, a couple and some gants. And, you know, we're just, we're in the, we're in the probably the final stages of these because, you know, it's just going to take a few more little tweaks here and a few more little tweaks there before it'll all be very clear to us how to work with these things. Because yeah. they're, feeding us, they're feeding us energy to be able to think clearly how to work with them. Yep, soon we'll be able to identify 90% uh, of the main uh, reactor engine combinations of the universe that are used in uh, uh, space travel ships and that kind of thing. Because 
we can just look at it and go, oh yeah, oh I see, they pump the GANs through here and uh, they, the fields operate this way and of course this is a Starship configuration underneath here and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know, because we're starting to analyze things and look at things in terms of the interrelationship of these different parts and so on and uh, in the fields that are involved, not just the parts, but the fields of the parts and and even if it isn't the real fields that are involved, we still project what it could be, what it should be, what it might look like, what it, what it, uh, you know, according to our calculations or according to our feelings or our instincts or our mental uh, abilities or whatever, then we have these uh, impressions that we get, and and uh, and uh, it's referenced by the actual stuff that happens in the universe that's apparently real that we see in front of us and it uh, is scalar so it's in the big scale and the small scale we see it on the nano level and atomic level we see it on the uh, macro level and in the the universe and the galaxies and whatnot all right mark let's have a look at your unit there it's uh, showing off its uh, loveliness so <laughs> oh did I, tempt, did I tempt you yes indeed it's, it's better than looking at my face on the screen here yakking away so uh, uh, we have something to refer to here and well that's this is actually sort of a, a bare bone skeleton of your um, fully clothed unit I suppose you might say eh? Yes, it is. It's um, it's a scaled down version of it. You see the little guys that I made that are all. So this was my this was my idea of the three out part of the three outriggers eventually that I thought I would have to make one of the three towers that would would have surrounded the big one the the real big unit. So oh, I see. Mm hmm. But then I kind of, I, this, this, the, what we're looking at, I modified this because if you re recall about two months ago, we talked about, uh, I wanted to make an experiment where I could uh, make GANs from plasma. If you remember that, that I wanted to make, try to make mm -hmm. GANs, because uh, I don't use power when it comes to making all my GANSes. I, I just use the air bubbler and time. And all my ganses are made, you know, and I wash them and they're, you know, I, I follow the, uh, all, all the cash protocol when it comes to doing the ganses and the nano coating. Washing is so, so important when it comes to this. And uh, I did some things before. I didn't even know I was washing it. Uh, and I thought I was doing it wrong, but I didn't, I never liked the idea of having the caustic on it. So when I very, my very first beginning uh, started uh, steaming these the night that I would steam it even though the steam cooled down I just pulled them out and put them dipped them in uh, distilled water I didn't really care about waiting for them to you know build I uh, Armin called it a rapid release way back in the day and I still do it and I still get a nice nano coat and, uh, I know for sure that none of my nano coating has any um, caustic in it caught in the uh, right from the very beginning. Because you gotta remember when you're nano coating, you're going coating after coating after coating. So, you know, if you don't want, I thought if you didn't wash after every coating, you might get some of that caustic trapped in between the layers. That was just my oddball thinking. But anyway, I digress. So what you're looking at here is I, it's just a three stacker unit. And in the middle, I, I inverted the, uh, the middle one to where it's a, uh, you know, it's a flipped unit where the we have the small one on the on the horizontal or on the uh, vertical, and I have the larger. I'll, I'll I'll come in a little closer in a minute uh, on the. Uh, maybe I'm not saying that right, but one goes up and one goes down, you know, on the flat. So you know, I was working with these capacitors in different forms and different you know. Um, materials inside them and everything and I made like 10 of them and every time I took readings off of them 
you know, I could take a positive and a negative reading off for each capacitor. Um, and that told me there that I, I could, I wasn't getting any type of a short out of it. But I, ha I made 10, but I had two of them that uh, read in reverse. Like if I put the clips on positive on the top and the negative on the outside wire, it would give me the reading for the capacitor. And I was only a, you know, mil all it, everything's in milli uh, millivolts. And I wrote, I have them all written down. But two of them would not, would not read out on the positive side. They were always in the negative. So I re reversed it and they gave me the reading the, the correct way, but reversed. Two of them reversed. And it made me mad because I had two of them that weren't simultaneous with the other eight of them. And it was funny, Caroline had a story uh, that she told about the Gantz, um, the, the nicotine Gantz that uh, the guy made in Germany for her. And she got it all the way home and she took the box out and the box was wet on the bottom and the, you know, the Gantz for the fell. And she realized it did not want, it didn't, the Gantz knew that it did not want to go and because it probably would have hurt her. She realized that. So I so that story told me, hey, they don't want to be the other way. You and then when I started putting a unit together, I needed two of them to reverse the polarity, so that I could get the figure eight in this. <laughs> it was so bizarre. After she told the story, it just made so much sense to me as to when I went to wire this together that the two of them could actually reverse from inside the capacitor to the outside capacitor. So, Cause like I said, the outside wire that I have, I always get a negative read on it and the pin on the inside, I always get a positive read on all of them, except for the two of them. So that told me that uh, from an inbound to an outbound. So at the very beginning of my unit, I could, I had a reversal and at the very end of my, unit I have a reversal so I don't know if you uh, I don't know it's hard to, to picture it was easy it was hard. it's hard for me to explain it but it was easy for me to picture it but it all went together to where I don't have any open ends on any of the uh, it, it's a complete feed it takes power um, right now I'm running it at like 10 volts and there's no sparks, there's no smoke, there's no nothing like that. And I there's a reason why I have it at 10 volts. And uh, I can get it in a little bit closer and there's, you can ask some questions about it and I can explain, you know, if, if, unless there's somebody else that wants, has something else that needs to show it, that's fine too. But uh, there's some, you know, some detailed things that people would like to, if you'd like to see or anybody else, we can, I can take the camera in. And, and kind of take a little bit closer. Sure, we want to go on, a, on an adventure inside your machine. <laughs> what was it I called, that, that movie, uh, Fantastic Voyage, where you go inside the human body and they were traveling around and so on? Here we go, yeah. Uh, well, let's see. Let's go here first. Let's go to the top first. Go a little bit higher. Well, I should show you here. There's the power supply right here. Now, I... Uh, Those things never show, but it's it's 10 volts, and it's all it's not quite it's not even near an amp yet, but and I'm only losing uh, on the meter here 10 volts, but it's given uh, the meter is giving me a 9.89, so I'm only losing a little bit, you know, on the on the readout. Does that make sense? Is the um, the orange meter on your output or input? You mean? Well, on the unit here. 
Yeah. Um. How would you? I don't know how. We, where would you? What What is it measuring? What is the orange meter measuring? The orange meter is me measuring uh, nine point eight nine. What? Are, where is it attached to, though? What? Are, where are the leads attached to? Is that what's coming out of your unit? Yeah. So you got the black, right. the negative here. Okay. Out of the power unit, and then the negative for the pickup here for the orange. And then you have the uh, red to red. So you think it, the I can put it anywhere, and it'll it's it reads out the same. Mm -hmm. Just as long as it's on the on the right part of the unit. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So I can take the I could take a reading on a, for a positive reading. You know where this is. I can take a reading to where this will stay this number here anywhere on a positive reading where I have the positive and the negative. But if I change it, then, you know, then you'll get the negative sign. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So th does that make sense uh, electrically? Otherwise, if there was a, sh if there was, if it wasn't wired correctly there would be a short right or there'd be a, a a greater loss of power is what i thought you know there wouldn't be a flow of power because i'm putting actually 10 volts through and i'm and i'm reading out all i'm only losing you know like i said it's 9.80 9.81 so i'm losing about 20 20 whatever 20 percent of that i don't know what that means but you know, it's, it should it should read ten ten, but it's just off. If it goes up another uh, 80, 80, 85, It would be ten ten all the way across, and then it yeah. would be perfect flow, right? Well, it's not unusual to have some sort of resistance uh, when you measure these things, especially at the lower voltages and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I've already had it up to thirty one volts, mm -hmm. and it matches out. Right on. Yep. So, and I'm not getting a short. So that just tells me that it does. It's not. There's no short in the system at all. That, that you know, it should. If there was a short. It should be sparking. It should be smelling like an electrical short in it somehow, some way. Yeah. But anyway, I digress. These here are just little. Uh, I made these capacitors in a couple of different forms. Some are just made like this one here is made with um, the core is a, a just a. Um, it's all, all the wire is 14 gauge wire, copper wire, nano coated. So the core of this one here at the beginning, I, I just cho chose this here to be the beginning. You have to have some place to be a beginning and the way it loops around. I chose the whole unit to be to the top unit and the bottom unit as a positive source. And I chose the middle unit as the negative uh source and the way i i decided that or the way it's wired out is all the positive um feed is going through the top wire and it's it's touching the core going through core and then it, the core you know the wire drops down all the way down to the bottom so that it feeds the oh i should i'm sorry i should have said it this way first it starts here, goes through the top, three top capacitors, then it dives into the um, top magrav, inbound magrav, loops around, loops around, loops around, then outbound, and then drops down to the middle. And what you're looking at the top here, I don't know if we've seen it the last week or, or that's months now, but it was my eggs. I, I, I had these little plastic eggs. And, and now we know to work with CH3, and we're trying to get um, tritium out of the out of the middle of those. And I got a, a a method to my madness. Maybe we'll talk about that. But anyway, so um, my goofy thinking was, I like the idea of silicon sand because sand and 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 
we, we were told that crystals have great power. Well, silicon sand is crystals. It's, it's the purest form of crystal you can get. I was going to go to the store and buy a quartz crystal and bust it up, but the guy's the guy from the geology, he said, just buy, Michigan has some of the best sand around, and that's the purest sand. It's beautiful quartz sand. I said, well, where do you, he said, just go ahead. You can get it. In. So I bought some quartz sand, and so I filled all three eggs with the quartz sand. And uh, then I filled Mark, where did you get your quartz sand? Uh, like an aquarium place or something? Or? Yeah, like, uh, yeah, aquarium place. Okay. And was it was it correct in thinking that sand is quartz? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, not all sand is quartz, but some sand will be quartz in different types and so on. And uh, yeah, you can do a study of all the beaches of the world, and each one has their uh, particular um, uh, quantities and qualities of not only quartz but other types of semi-precious uh, stones, gems, and uh, other types of rock and so on, of course, as well. So that gave me the idea to put them in the put them in the eggs to see what. So for the memory's sake and the and, and the, the all the good qualities that come along with it. So then, what I did was, since we learned that we have to try to get the separation between the two different types of um, um, ganses, what I did was. I, I, uh, I should, maybe I should get the other one to make it easier to see what they look like. This was my original prototype. So what I did was, you know, can you see that? All I did was just put a, a, a ring around the outside, so the inside is filled with um, uh, CH3, and I have different types of CH3s so that we I could get different effects. So I chose three different one a bio salt, one a Himalayan salt, one a, a potassium uh, magnesium potassium CH3. I have three different types of uh, CH3s. So each egg has the different potassium, the bio CH3, and the Himalayan CH3. So then what I did was each one of the outside rings, I, I Could used- Could you uh, lower your hand a bit or raise the camera because you're getting oh, out I'm of sorry. view there. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. So each one of the rings, what I did was, the eggs now were completely filled with the sand and as much of the um, CH3 that I could possibly get in it because the sand took a lot and I kept on shaking it to try to get as much to fill in as I could. Then what I did was each one of them, I, um, so say, so say this one was the bio salt inside. I put the Himalayan salt outside, all CH3. And then on the outside, what I did was I put just a little bit, maybe, um, five drops of, um, uh, zinc oxide just to get the conversion to go so that it's that should always put just a little bit of zinc oxide and it and my some of my zinc so it's pure it's all pure zinc so so each one of them i'm hoping that that's what gets the rotation started that start because like john said with the C, different uh ch3s if i can start to pull the uh, carbon bond off that hydrogen, which that's what's inside here is the C, the H, and if, if the 10 amps can start to pull that, that's my, that was my think, that's my could, thinking anyway. Could you lower your right. hand? We need to see your thing, your egg. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> it's a, <laughs> I keep, it's a beautiful yeah, egg, but you keep <laughs> raising it up and tempting <laughs> us with it there. No, it looks like an egg from space. It's it's great. I love it. So my idea was that uh, if there was enough uh, enough of these CH threes in this in in the same vicinity, and I it, like he said the uh, uh, not the deuterium uh, the uh, tritium 
will start to form once that H or once that uh, C bond starts to decouple from that. And he said it took about um, 10 volts for two weeks in that system that he made. So I just, this is just a playful thing. And I just thought, well, man, wouldn't that be a great idea if I could just get my MAGRAF to start to pull that, that bond, that, that carbon bond. And then I thought, well, you know, there's got to be a stronger carbon field for that carbon bond to go to. So I thought, well, because I made one of these capacitors with just a, um, this one back here is just a carbon rod, a, a, just a small piece of carbon wrapped with um, uh, a nano-coated um, braided wire, just a small piece of braided wire. And then I put the uh, paper, the, the paper towel around it, or the, the, the actually the um, handy wipes that Sandors, I like those, uh, those wipes that he suggested. They, they hold moisture better. And I, every one of my capacitors are left open on the top so that they could, I thought maybe that if they they were left open on the top that they could actually absorb um, water. You know, if they actually needed water, that the water could be absorbed by that tissue that is highly absorbent. That's why I thought I used it. So that's why I didn't cap off the tops. I left them open so that, oh, except for this one. This one was a different experiment, and I can explain that in a minute. But that's all the other all the other capacitors are open top capacitors. So, but to get back to my, my original thought here was you needed a higher order of um, carbon in order to stri st strip that carbon. It had to, it had to go someplace. So, so this, I'm hoping that this carbon rod is a higher field in order to pull those carbon um, molecules away from these hydrogen fields. Does that make sense to you, Rick? Is that what I, I maybe I'm adding that and I didn't I'm not clear could, about could that you uh, maybe just raise the camera a little bit we can see the carbon rod there at the top and so on when you're pointing I wasn't quite sure what you're pointing to so the carbon oh, rod is the one with the um, uh, that's got the uh, clip attached to it there no it's the one actually behind it okay mm -hmm. I have three on the top and actually four in the middle and three on the bottom so uh, the front one was made with um, just a um, um, uh, a zinc a, 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 a zinc plate, just a tightly rolled piece of zinc with just a nano coated piece of copper wire gone down into it, and then the zinc and the the paper towel rolled together and then the tin foils on the outside of each one of them. And that would be the sep the paper towel is the separation. That's why it's, and I thought maybe it was, should st start sparking or something, but it hasn't sparked. I'm not getting any burning. And I thought maybe that the paper towel inside might um, dry up and then sparking might happen. So I'm, yeah, so that's, it's one that's one of the risky things with uh, dealing with um, that kind of setup with the paper towel deal. Um, right. Even the um, the oven paper, the uh, what do you call it, parchment paper that they use for baking. I noticed that if you use a little torch or a lighter and put it on the paper, it reaches a certain point, and then it just catches on fire and burns like normal paper. So, yes. uh uh, it's uh, a bit dicey that way, but the thing about it is, if everything's functioning properly, then you shouldn't have hot spots or overheating and and you know burning stuff and so on. A lot of that dependent on the conditioning, I think, and the uh, uh, how much load is on the actual unit and and how quickly that load's put on according to that conditioning phase. You might so say. So we'll see. I'm just going to let it, you know, operate for a while. Because like I said, we're, John said it took a couple of weeks for the process to happen. I don't know mm -hmm. if I'm going to let it run overnight without being attentive. I yeah. just started I, the power. So yeah, we'll see. I, it, 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 I don't know if it's building fields. You know, you feel, you say, do you feel the fields? How, what's, since I put it all together, 
the only thing I can say about it is my, it just seems like I feel something in my solar plex different. Like, like when I, when I get a little bit closer to it, it feels a little bit different. Mm -hmm. When I get a little bit farther away, not so much. Mm -hmm. What that feeling is, eh, maybe I'm just excited that it's, that I have something and it's actually working. I think. Who knows? Well, it's your baby. You've, you've <laughs> given birth. That's what it is. That's the feeling in your belly. You've given birth. <laughs> I got an experiment going finally. Well, it is a connection that we do feel, and we, I, I believe, uh, and know from experience that it's often felt in the in the gut area, in the solar plexus, this attachment, as opposed to you know feeling it through a, the heart or or chest or eyes or brain or, or some other location so it seems like these tendrils go out that attach to our solar plexus I mean it's called a solar plexus it's the Sun and it's the center Sun center so our solar plexus is actually our Sun center of our essence in, in a way so uh, like that is the sun center of your apparatus, so it makes sense you would have a connection between what we're looking at and your your solar plexus, especially with all the zinc and the tender loving care you put into all the twists and turns and coatings and cuttings and there's a heck of a lot of work going going on in what we're looking at here. I mean, it looks kind of funky with you know this kind of gooey stuff that's coated all over everything and and whatnot but it actually represents some very clear ideas and uh, and consistent ideas with the way the universe works and whatnot so and you've applied everything as as uh, meticulous and uh, true to the teaching as as you can mark I can't find you know flaws with your uh, with your logic and and the way that you've done things uh, well I think I thank you Rick that means a lot to me it's like I said I, I never wanted to ever ever o overstep my boundaries I always wanted to whatever I could do to help uh, promote the, the, the positivity that mr. Kesh um, tries to teach each and every one of us every week it's it's just a it's a privilege and an honor and i hope i've done things in a correct manner well the bottom line is if your solar plexus is responding then you've done things in the correct manner well they're jumping <laughs> right? because it's a two-way uh, it's a two-way thing i mean building these different devices that we built the the you know the four reactor uh, starship configuration a couple of years ago and got that going. It's you know the the, the same uh, picture you see on the live stream uh, logo for the live stream channel and so on. And we actually were working with feeling these combinations and and trying to connect them with the other combinations that are working on other parts of the planet and so on and still do and this is um, sort of the miracle of the whole process is that not only do our devices change and our ideas for the devices and so on but we change we actually are you know we forced to think about and become more uh, sensitive to our own sensing apparatus you could say our own uh, reactors inside and and you know, we have to start contemplating and and uh, um, thinking. You know, what what uh, what tools do I have inside myself that are available? How can I become more sensitive? How can I feel the fields? Or do I feel anything? Or was it in my imagination? Is it all in my imagination? <laughs> Maybe. You people are all in my imagination too, and the whole world is my imagination. Anyway, we can get pretty far out there with some of the thoughts and the impressions we have and whatnot. But bottom line is if you feel it in your gut, then that's about as real as it gets, I think. And uh, if 
and then we can learn to of course make that stronger and we end up becoming more and more sensitive and at the same time more and more um, sort of uh, uh, the closer we can come to this unconditional um, the unconditional love essentially that's that's uh, the, at the core of all of the the stuff that we do it's has to be at the core of our intention and at of our uh, of our wish for um, what we have to occur what we want to happen out there in the world and inside of ourselves so I think that you know everybody in this group in one way or another has expressed that uh, that wish so I think that's really important and no matter what we build if you build it with unconditional love it could be the funkiest looking thing in the world but uh, it will have that uh, effect of affecting others in a uh, beneficial way and definitely affecting ourselves in a beneficial way I mean, is there any other way that something should be built in the world really other than with unconditional love what condition would you like to put on the things that get built we give com complete unconditional love to our new cars that we're building except for um, well there's these things and these parts and this part and that part that we didn't quite give unconditional love for <clears throat> like I hear actually for example uh, in the Tesla car company they um, the uh, workers on on the cars get together and basically give a little blessing to each car when it goes out they they celebrate each each um, individual car that gets produced apparently and uh, which is different than uh, you know General Motors which most of the workers are probably cursing the cars by the time they go out rather than blessing them and they, they don't have the you know a group get together a group feel good get together at the end they, they have a couple of quality control people that maybe check things but <clears throat> they don't do it as a uh, any kind of uh, blessing type ritual or any kind of not a ritual exactly but a you know just a, a simple offering that this this uh, device that got you know, manufactured is goes out the door with the blessing of the people that put it together it's an extra boost sort of that to, to give it some uh, some uh, strength in the uh, in the world it's adds to its magrev fields So, anyway, congratulations on the birth of this one, Mark. It's another beauty. And Thanks, it's Rick. It, it's just, a, you know, if it, it comes with love and it comes with fun. And everything we, you know, to this point and this point forward, um, I'm just very thankful for everything, the time that. I put in is time for everyone. I give my everything to everyone with peace and love. Thanks. Yeah, I was just going to mention the global peace uh, mission here that the people from the associated with the Cash Foundation are on till August second or third, um, at least and uh, trying to get the world leaders to sign the world peace treaty and of course um, a big part of that effort is trying to uh, arrive at that place of peace within ourselves try to come closer to our our archetype of um, having uh, peace within ourselves so that that gets transferred naturally to the the world at large and all our interactions are, and so on and part of that effort was uh, led by or suggested by uh, Caroline who suggested that, that we use the mirror like pretty much everybody looks at themselves in a mirror in the morning to confirm they're still alive and 
don't have things uh, that the public would say that, oh, look at so-and-so, they've got something all over their face that they didn't wipe off from the day before or whatever. So uh, we look in the mirror to start off our day, and she was saying that to look in the mirror and do a little exercise of basically just calling yourself beautiful and that, you know, you were completely uh, okay and so on. And, um, and that this was to be sort of a little exercise to smile into the mirror, that this idea of calling yourself beautiful in the mirror should make you smile and kind of, you know, laugh a bit perhaps. And um, so different people are trying that and other other exercises to sort of activate this uh, part of ourselves that's maybe a little more compassionate and a little more um, tolerant and a little more loving and possibly a lot more of all of the above if we can key into that as, as our mode of operation through the day. So maybe if everyone on the planet did that, especially our leaders, then we'd be in a, a better position as we go along. All right, um, I digress a bit there, but sometimes digressions are the main topic. Where else do we want to go with this? Um, what, what else you got there, Mark? What else do you want to say about your, uh, your device and your eggs and whatnot? I like the idea of the crystal, <coughs> the crystal egg which is essentially what you have with the, uh, the crystal, crystallized sand being, uh, um, you know, primarily uh, quartz crystal, all jammed into an egg shape, which is perhaps a better shape than a, a plain sphere, when, especially when under the effects of gravity. And, uh, and then you've got the liquid in there, to take up any space in between the uh, crystal. So in effect, you, the crystal is now in a vacuum environment rather than the uh, air environment. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think you better uh, unplug that thing at night because you never <laughs> know what could happen. <laughs> you might come up down to a hole in your roof and uh, roughly the same sh size as this piece of plastic, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't even really explained the little colored balls that are sitting there. Okay, yeah, yeah, because they're not egg-shaped, are they? They're, uh, they're, they're round. They're, they're a little bit smaller than a um, ping-pong ball. I just wanted something mm -hmm. light. And what I did with that is I just drilled a little hole in there and I just put the same type of materials that are in the eggs in those to be a free forming. If they feel like moving or if they feel like rolling or if they feel like, you know, if there's enough. The reason why I did it is if, if there's enough uh, ability in the unit to pull the uh, C bond off of that uh, CH3 in there. There's just a little bit in that ball, and I'm just wondering if it would be light enough with leftover hydrogen in there to lift any one of those up off that plate. That would be my hope, and that's my experiment for those that are that little ball that's sitting there. So the the little balls have the sand in them too. Is that right? The... No, no, I didn't. Oh, put okay. No, I wanted them as light as, as possible. And I just okay. wanted them to be there, in, you know, with just a little bit of CH, um, the different types of the CH3. All three of the different types of CH3s that I have in each one of the eggs are in the, you know, like one has the Himalayan CH3, one has the uh, bio salt CH3, and the other one has the... Um, potassium and magnesium CH3. And then all three of them, I just put, like I said, a couple of drops of uh, uh, 
zinc oxide for the uh, connection for both you know the harmonious connection that the ch or the uh, the um, uh, zinc oxide provides for our planet is it's the connector it's the muscle it's the tissue it's 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 the bridge to what i think is the connecting point you don't need a lot of it i don't think but just by using it in my spray and in on myself, I realize how important um, zinc oxide with the CO2. Um, the CO2 is so readily available that I think that it's, like I said, it's readily available, more readily available than the uh, zinc oxide. So uh, that's why I just look, put a little bit in each one of them. So if the unit starts to pull from it, any one of the balls or, you know, it, there's actually different places where different uh, elements and fields can start to either um, be developed or disperse where it is needed. And I, when I take the power off, it holds power. Uh, it, it drops down after a while, but it, it'll hold itself for about at least an hour with a half a volt and that's where it will stay. It'll, it stays charged. It doesn't go down to zero. I mean, it stays alive, you know, at a very low rate. And I, like I said, the, some of those little capacitors that I, the, the best one I had was, it was reading uh, consistent uh, six, six, 600 millivolts, which is almost uh, a half, just a little bit more than a half a volt. That was my best one. And then I had a five, I had a three. But actually, when if you added them all up, the, the millivolts, the, the, each tray equals a thousand millivolts, if that makes sense. So each capacitor, for some reason or another, you know, they're within like 20 uh, millivolts. So, but in, in, in its entirety, it was um, the top, the, all, each one of them, like I said, one was like 980, one was uh, uh, a 1,020, and the other one was 1,010 or whatever. But so I just, you know, in the equal parts, they all kind of equaled out. I have three on the top, three on the bottom, and four in the middle. And like I said, though, the ending of them starts, the end is in the middle and the starting point is at the top and the top feeds the bottom and all power goes to the middle and the middle is the pull point. It's the strong, it'll, I believe that that should be the strongest field. It has four posts in order to make the field. So like I said, as time goes on, we'll see. Uh, I've been excited around it for the last couple of days. I don't know what it can do or how it's supposed to do or what, you know, I don't expect it to do anything. I, I believe it could do a lot. My, my feeling inside me feels like it can do more than what I'm looking at. And I think that's the, that's my intention with it is that something's going to happen something will show itself to me with observation and i think that's what it's all about is when we observe things and watch things and you know take notes that's where we you know go to the next step the phs and all the different things that we've learned are, are all starting to make sense to us now and it's just a matter of time before like we said one of us in this group is going to have the door open for us and we'll be lucky enough to share it with each other. And I, I hope it is one of us, and I know it's gonna be one of us, and I can't wait for the day, because when we do, we'll share it with all of us. Yeah, good point, Mark. <clears throat> yeah, because uh, playing around with these experiments and generating ideas amongst each other uh, can, can spark some really uh, uh, serious uh, possibilities here so looking forward to that in the next while actually uh, uh, Guy and I are setting up a new uh, lab space and it'll be uh, interesting what comes out of that because once we get 
bouncing off of each other and playing with products um, it could uh, it could be quite an interesting time in spite of the physicality stuff of it in a way it's uh, I mean that's what we that's what we have to deal with at this time and place we have the physicality we have our this thing we call a body and uh, the whole set that goes with that so <clears throat> in a way we should take advantage of what we know on different levels and you know apply some of the, uh, the teachings whether to just confirm for ourselves or to confirm for others and uh, you know with the general attitude of helping others and uh, that's when some I think that's when the really the really cool things could be developed with that attitude of helping others it gives one a necessity and urgency you might say or necessity to uh, perform to to uh, come up with something because it is needed in the world rather than just something out of our idle curiosity or you know because we just want to try something to to uh, have something to stick in the living room or something like that but if it's um, done with intent to help the maximum number of beings in in our in our world whatever that world is then uh, that's got to be uh, automatically uh, put you in a position where not only the information becomes more easily available but you'll find that coincidences start lining up and you pick out you know just the right uh, piece of uh, uh, plastic tubing at uh, the Home Depot or hardware store where you happen to be going to and or someone you run into has some particular part that you're looking for and asks you if you needed it uh, out of the blue and this sort of thing so <clears throat> I think if we work with uh, with coincidence and with our hearts then these kinds of projects could actually uh, uh, blossom quite well and sometimes they may not you know end up producing these effects that we want it may not go through the roof and maybe that'll be disappointing to us <laughs> some people want their devices to go through the roof that would be a sure sign of success but uh, uh, on the other hand um, even if they don't do anything something happens some movement is caused inside of us when we create these things and, and attach our emotions to them and work through the processes of understanding to get to the point of knowing uh, you know that putting a little ball here or a little egg here or a coil here it has significance it has uh, symmetry it has a certain uh, way that things are done and each of us has our own particular ways of doing those those ways but they are also guided under certain universal laws that we're trying trying to tune into inside of ourselves and and reflect it outside of ourselves and if we conform to those laws then uh, we're sure to succeed in one way or another and if not we can always tear it down and use the parts for the next invention Okay, so what else about that, Mark? Well, we'll see. Um, now at least I know that, you know, this was just a stepping stone for me. And uh, what I was going to say about this is, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to uh, measure this, the, the effects of this thing with things that are measure... We don't even understand what we're, you know, I can just, you know, in my imagination, what if I'm just producing a beautiful, brilliant light 
coming now that it's connected into the universe and it's saying exactly how I feel. And, but I don't even know that because I don't have any way to measure it or or uh, 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 tangibly hold it or see it or feel it. But the beautiful thing is, it could be happening. It could be it could be transcending time and space, and I don't even know it. And 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 but. But it, it's made, it's here, and it's having, like like you said, Rick, it's having an effect. And some of those effects that are it's having, I have no I have no idea. I have no way of, of of measuring it. Or the only way I can I can tangibly tell anybody what's happening right now is how I feel inside me. There's no tools. There's no methods. There's no calculus or anything like that this is a whole new science and the, the the beauty of it is as we learn more we'll be able to look back and we'll be able to say did you see the, look at that he, and and he did that, and that look at that caveman that old caveman he put all those wires together and broke that hole in the field and it was allowing all the light to come in again that's what I'm hoping for Mm-hmm. Well, <clears throat> it's definitely uh, projecting out to whoever is in the sound of our voice at this point, because wherever the sound of our voice is, is usually where the video is also playing. So they'll have an image and an impression of that image, and they'll and your voice and your wish will be carried with that wherever this is seen, and it. You know, it may, might possibly be seen for many years if uh, everything holds together on the planet and in the internet and in the worlds of interest of people and whatnot. Perhaps these little uh, meetings will be played for years, or perhaps it'll disappear in a week or two and not too many people think about it, let's say. But I don't think that's the case. I think this is a case there where this kind of impression that goes out and people either go you know like what is that ridiculous looking thing or you know <laughs> this guy's crazy or it'll be wow what a inspired brilliant piece of uh, work you know that uh, I could see all the the reason for each one of these parts and uh, you've guided us through your logic and your reasoning and, and so on and, over the last year or two of these kinds of devices that you've been playing with, especially with the plastic tubing and whatnot. So, I mean, it's full range of impressions of the human impressions of, you know, if you would give a, a picture of this, just a picture of what we see on the screen now, to each of the six or whatever billion uh, humans that are out there, each one of them would have a different impression and 99.999999999% uh, of them would not have a clue what this would be and the other point one percent mostly wouldn't know either and they would be the ones that associate with uh, you know the cash foundation know some of the ins and outs of these capacitors and coils and Ganses and all this stuff that we talk about in this thing and so but yet these other six billion they will get an impression and some of them will giggle and go oh well, that's really neat or they'll go oh that's really cute or they'll go oh that's totally ugly or I don't know what this is it's you know like it'll, it'll be full range right but the fact is it will produce an impression that will be out of the ordinary for sure because it's not something you see every day you don't go in the supermarket and go and pick one of these off the shelves you don't go into your stereo mart and uh, oh do you have a you know a, a, a Starship Magrev uh, reactor uh, available I'd like to pick one up this afternoon that's just not happening I'd like the, the mark the Mark 10, uh, we'll call it Mark 10 because each one of your devices is a Mark, <laughs> we'll call it Mark 1, Mark 2, Mark, you're probably up to Mark 10 or something here with this one. 
and uh, you know I'd like the Mark 10 model please um, do you have that on the shelf you don't you don't have it in stock or where can I get one there must be some place in town that's got one of these things. no that doesn't happen so much it's a unique uh, individual thing where you've put your stamp on it your uh, signature your uh, frequency into it basically and we can identify with that and most of us that are involved with this group especially the cash plasma reactor group you know that's the name and that's the game <laughs> and so this is a you know the classic example of someone's uh, reactor system that is one of the uh, as Mr. Kesh says there's as many types types of reactors as there are stars in the universe so this is like one one star out of our universe you could say and it's one that we recognize because it's it's got the it's got the stuff that we recognize as, as in this group we've come to learn to uh, to get to know. Anyway, I kind of uh, went on, rambled quite a oh, no, long no. bit on that. We, we appreciate your thought pattern here because you're our fearless leader that gives us cohesion, all of us. We need... We, we, we have all put, not, not by your choice, but by all of our choice, we have pushed you up, up on the platform. <laughs> we love you so much, and we, we just want to send positive energy to you because you are the thread and the needle that holds all this together. I'm telling you, brother, <laughs> well, if I had it so often, you know what? You don't have to do any of this wiring and this hard work because I'm coming to get you. The minute it works, we're celebrating. We'll put our feet up on the beach. We'll have a nice cup of coffee. And we'll say, yeah, that was well worth it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it may not be that far away as well. That uh, Things are rapidly moving in the world. And... Uh, I am no longer surprised. It seems like all the wishes that I've wished for in my life are starting to to uh, to come true, to uh, to blossom in, in the last uh, few years, I would say. So uh, we live in really interesting times now, and we get to have our our deepest wishes be fulfilled. And uh, part of that wish is the wish to. Uh, be able to travel in space in, and travel on Earth too in a in a more elegant way than we have been with our uh, machinery that gets us around now, or our things we call cars and uh, airplanes and trains and uh, ships and whatnot. <clears throat> These are very antiquated ways of moving around in the world of matter and. Uh, I think we can do a lot better as humans and, and better and cheaper and easier and let's make it a, a joy to uh, travel to the other side of the planet in a few minutes instead of a chore that takes a, a day or two and you're exhausted literally at the end of it because of all the exhaust from the airplanes and the airports and the, uh, the, the, just the this, this sheer trip of it all is uh, it's no longer required in my estimation I think we can move to a new a new world that's got all the benefits that we have dreamed of and it still has the security that we need so that we don't have uh, you know a bus being thrown from the other side of the world at us and, and that kind of thing which technically this kind of technology might be able to do if someone had the intention and could actually formulate it in the presence of the fields of this thing which might be difficult to do it might be hard to uh, to do things in anger if you're in the presence of um, a piece of uh, equipment that can put out those kinds of fields that we're talking about it seems to be almost mutually exclusive in fact, Mr. Cash has talked about it in terms of, you know, the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the, um, 
the entry into this uh, spaceship, the, uh, oh, what do they call it, uh, when you're in the uh, International Space Station, they've got the, or in Star Trek, the place where you come into the ship and you exit the ship, the, help me with this, somebody. <laughs> airlock, Rick, perhaps? Airlock, yeah, like the airlock part, where you go in and, uh, um, basically, you're you would have to pass the inspection even to go into this to the ship to have it accept you. You would have to have a certain amount of uh, um, you know acceptability to that space, which would mean that you would be not, I guess, not too far attached to the physicality and not have too much in the way of negative emotion that you're dragging around with you not in other words you have to leave your baggage at the door you might say your one's one's uh, emotional baggage needs to be left and physical baggage probably might have to be left at the at the door and only the um, things that are acceptable on the GANs and plasma level gets to come through the door of the spaceship in order to uh, to do the traveling <coughs> So you might have to leave your gold rings and jewelry at home. But not our bodies. The body might be all right. In, cer in certain spaces, as Mr. Kesh has, has said, that you might come to, if you're traveling in space and you have a body, like what we call a body physicality realm, then there may be fields that are encountered that are too strong for that physicality realm, in which case it may dissolve the physicality, in which case we may revert to our this essential self or essence or the next level that's left after the physicality and, and carry on in that um, regard and then if we need, feel the need to uh, reconstitute a physicality then essentially we we do that according to our wish and end up on some planet somewhere and uh, all of a sudden we hear a sound and it's something like <laughs> and it's us being born <clears throat> yeah yeah or made into some other entity and maybe we would want a life as a hummingbird or something I don't know as a co-creator as a co-creator is a good choice if you're if you're willing especially if, yes well that's the thing it's uh, all sounds good until you are the co-creating co and find out this is what I have to do for eternity oh my this goodness now. A little more, and now, and now, and now, and now. It's always now, and you're always creating. That's the part, I think that's the part that that is the hardest part for humans to understand is that the now is always the now. It doesn't matter. The now is the now, and the loop will the the continuation of the now will always be. We just yes. Not aware of it, and no, being we yeah, being in the now does not being is, does not mean being in the now that I just talked about as the now a few seconds ago, or the one a minute ago, or the one I just talked about, or the one a half a second ago. It means one now, which is now and now and now, and you can break it's it down now. into smaller and smaller and smaller time periods but you're always a little bit removed unless you really are totally in now and that means a lot to be able to get there is uh, requires dropping all the baggage basically and that's uh, a difficult task for most of us humans because we like to carry at least a handbag or uh, our clothes and a uh, few necessities you know it's nice to have put it this way Rick you know how to how to shed those ideas? Go to a nudist camp. Shed <laughs> your first time. 
<laughs> well, that's true. That's true. It man. is such an embarrassing feeling when the first time that you have got to present yourself in a in a way that no other people do. When you stand in front of beings with no clothes on in the sunshine of the day. Yeah. They tell you to drop them because do everybody you, else is. Do you know where I learned that? Uh, strangely enough, Mark. Nope. Nearby to where you live in Flint, Michigan. I live about an hour away. Right. So you know. So uh, I went to, uh, as I talked before, I went to a place called General Motors Institute, which is actually no longer called General Motors Institute, but in that those days it was. And um, that was back in the, the heyday of the 70s, being uh, 1973 to 1975 when I was there. And I think it was in uh, 74. Four, I believe that streaking became popular <laughs> now you know what streaking is but a lot of people especially if they're younger they might not even know what it is but streaking was I think it started with somebody in a wasn't it in like a football game or somebody where somebody uh, you know ran naked down the, the football uh, um, field in Ann Arbor Michigan and yeah. Football game. <laughs> yeah, and then this started this this fad where people just stripped off, literally butt naked, and would would do things like just uh, um, they do things like called a fire alarm, where you where you and your friends would be naked. You pull up in in your car to a, a stoplight. And everybody gets out of the car, runs around the car, gets back in, and takes <laughs> off again. Or, uh, or people would just be, you know, caught in public. Uh, they'd be just running through and streaking. It was called running naked through public, essentially. So this this fad caught on to uh, to the university where I was at, and on the campus and whatnot. So. Uh, my buddy and I, we just ended up trying this, and uh, yep, we we took our clothes off and ran down the halls of the uh, campus and into where the where the uh, you know some of the classes were held and so on and so forth, and just ran through and ran back. <laughs> Other people were doing this, and there was this reports of this popping up through the uh, through the um, the whole campus actually, and. Uh, and there's some women involved with uh, the, the uh, uh, this university, and not that many at that time. Only five percent or something were women at that time. I remember they actually streaked as well, but they left their <laughs> they left their bras and panties on, so they kind of cheated. But uh, they gave it a go anyways. Hey, and hey, you know this this was all was totally okay. acceptable at that time. Uh, for somehow and it was just this opening in the universe where that became popular and all across America at that time it started popping up and on different university campuses especially and just all all around you could never you never knew when it when it would happen and it was very liberating to both do it and like you're saying to go to a nudist camp or whatever and spend time there would be very liberating too you'd realize you know this whole thing of clothes is pretty silly when it comes right down to it and so on if if we're all the same being especially then hello what what are we really hiding something that the same being has never seen before or, or, or whatever and you know it, a lot of questions come up when when you start to uh, sort of look at things from that point of view and it was all completely innocent at the time there's no you know uh, there was sexuality no wasn't even introduced really it wasn't as if you were uh, getting was, a glimpse of someone or something it, it was no big it deal it was, a, it was a feeling of liberating yourself yeah to show that i am present you're yes, right. exactly, Mark. Yes, very well done. Yes, and Showing it was fun. 
it was, it was fun. That it was okay to be present and not have to put your clothes they, on. Basically. They stifled that feeling and they repressed it. And do you remember how the big repression came from that reaction? Or you know how the 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 I don't the, the people the the the, uh, the oppressors what they did was they went and shot children on the campus of Ohio to, to quell all this stuff down. The burning of the bra, the marches, the rebellion. Right. Yes, the people and, were, were rebelling against the Vietnam War at that time. That was uh, part of this feeling of uh, love that was coming out, this, uh, you know, this uh, feeling of, of oneness with others and, and so on. And that was being suppressed, and yeah, there was uh, the song by, what was it, Crosby, Stills, and Nash and Young, uh, Four Killed in Ohio, I think it is. So, yes, indeed. And and that's how, you know, they they gutted us. You know, there was a, it was a, it was a, such a peaceful movement. Peaceful people laying around, sharing water. If you had yep. a dime or a dollar to share, who cared? Yep, Grass, that's right. Grass or cash, no ride will get you that far. You know. Yeah, and everybody. people were talking about free energy and free love and free everything at that point. And the uh, National um, uh, Democratic Party, the NDP, that's uh, now the opposition, one of the opposition parties in Canada here. They were talking about uh, a guaranteed annual income and freeing up the laws about different things and so on. This was all, you know, back in 19, mid 1970s, we were talking about here. And then all of a sudden, things shut down because what happened in 1975, you recall, there's what, what was called the energy crisis. And all of a sudden, uh, um, you know the the automotive sector was in trouble because they had no vehicles that were good on gas they were all gas guzzlers essentially other than the vega and that was a hopeless case in itself and uh, and it was uh, things were collapsing because of all the the oil business and so on and so forth it was uh, but that may have been if, when you think about it that may have been sort of a smoke screen um, to make sure that whole movement didn't go more forward than it already did. Um, I think they were trying to repress that free feeling because people were just feeling too good. Oh, it was a, it was a really nice time and, you know, like I said, you know, that was such a free feeling. And, and that's what I think this technology is. We're trying to free ourselves from the shackles. Yes, you know? that's right. And when you think about it, um, if you look at even the old pictures from back in the 70s and so on, and, you know, people uh, whooping it up and really going for their freedom and that kind of thing. But it was a different freedom then. It was, uh, it was personalized in, in, and also with, you know, with group and uh, thinking of others. There was... Uh, communities that were established where people get together and live together in communities and so on that were off-grid and all this kind of stuff but it was still very much a personal a personal trip you might say and it didn't quite incorporate the world picture into it and it certainly didn't emphasize the greater the off-world picture the universal picture I think that's what's making this movement uh, different, is we are including the universal picture as well, that, that picture that, that our world peace is not just so we can all get along with each other, it's we're, we're shooting for world peace so we can get along with each other, so we can get off the planet and get along with those that are out in the universe and you know the other life forms and so on so we can establish our place in the universe not just our place in our community or in our nation or in our on our planet but actually in the next step in our establishing our presence in the universe and 
I think because we're now taking into account that totality rather than the more limited view of the 60s and 70s and, and whatnot, then uh, I think it's got a, a much better chance of uh, taking off this time around. And plus we have the internet and mass communications and, and so on. At least so far, keeping fingers crossed, uh, that may come to uh, an end at any point because we have to be careful of what authorities would like to do in case of declaring war and that kind of thing. They would probably shut down a lot of their uh, privileges for internet. But being humans the way we are, we will find ways around it for sure because we want and need to communicate with each other now and that's the uh, bottom line is that's not going to get stopped that's not going to get uh, it's not going to get uh, messed with basically because anyone does that they'll find that we will re-establish communications very rapidly in whatever way we can so it's a really uh, a beautiful encouraging world that we're opening up into and uh, there's many many uh, points that are coming together, many points of light are coming together, you might say, with both the financial system, the, the uh, uh, religious groups are looking more uh, uh, that they're coming together and establishing some sort of uh, uh, peace amongst themselves and, you know, the, the nations of the world just came together a couple of weeks ago and formed the uh, uh, a non-nuclear pact, um, or at least 121 of the nations came together. And so all we're missing now is the major industrial nations. <laughs> so that's, and that's coming along actually. Uh, they're starting to see, and we'll probably have a demonstration at some point, that the, the technology of weapons is obsolete and it's just no longer workable, it's no longer uh, worth it to you know, put together billions of dollars for these aircraft carriers and other things that uh, you know, the US just launched a new, air, new uh, uh, ship for their navy and uh, I think it was an aircraft carrier just last week I think it was and the response from Russia is it's uh, I forget the exact term, but basically they said it's a, a great sitting duck for, for the new technologies. It's, you know, this is the thing, is what can we possibly produce as a weapon that's going to withstand um, the change of attitudes that people have now, that we don't wish to have weapons and use them. And the use of weapons makes those that use them look like fools, especially if they use them and it gets turned against themselves because they don't pay attention that the technology's changed and we have capability. Uh, there may be um, there may be countries that have returned to sender technology that can send weapons back to where they came from. And that should be enough to, if that happens once or twice as a demonstration, then that should be adequate to uh, establish that weapons are, are obsolete, outdated, and in fact dangerous to keep weapons. If you have nuclear weapons, your population is going to start to say, wait a minute, we don't want these. If we launch these weapons and they use the return to sender technology and they send them back to us, why would we want that? <laughs> so you explain to us why you keep these weapons and why you would want these weapons to be turned right back on ourselves. You gotta be kidding me. People would actually say, you know, that is, did, can you believe that people actually want to spend their money, have their government spend money when they would actually know, know that the facts that there's that this could come back to them. I, that would, to me, that is a perfect. That's what I'm saying. When um, I hope with all my heart and soul that we have enough in this technology, that the technology that we figured out to to have something to say to them, 
return to sender. Have a nice day. Put your family out in front first, and then I would be more than glad to eat from the table. But your family eats first. You and your family and all of you that say yes to this terrible, buy a gun, shoot a bullet, kill a family. You go out in front first, and then we'll follow. You eat that poison first, and then we'll follow. Well, uh, please, let's have this technology. That's what I mean. Peace comes with, with, with that, with that. I don't want to say power, but you gotta have a little, little kick in the butt to say, "Hey, you people are done, done. Do not do this to us anymore. You're, the the game is over. Return to sender. Thank you very much. Good night." Have a nice night. Bye-bye. I'm sorry, Rick. <laughs> yeah, essentially. And what if we had technology that, I mean, you mentioned guns and, you know, like uh, someone comes up to you and says, you don't have any guns. Oh, I've got, you know, five and I've got three of them on me now. <laughs> yeah, that's a good line. And it's true. Some people would, actually. And uh, some people would if they could and so on so we have these armed weapons out there and lots of them in detroit is probably the armed weapon capital of the world uh, maybe in competition with uh with chicago or something but uh you know or at least in uh such a competition you know yeah <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, come on but me... but think about it though what if we had the technology that uh, for example um when people walk into a movie theater, they go through this, uh, uh, instead of a metal detector, it goes, you go through a, a, a bullet deactivator. And basically it's a plasma field that deactivates any uh, uh, firearms uh, material, you know, like uh, 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 powder, you know, black powder or whatever. Sucks the carbon right out of it. Yeah, sucks the carbon out of it, doesn't hurt humans. And it only works in this tune for that field so that people can walk into a movie theater and enjoy their company with others, not feel they have to carry an arm to, to arm themselves in case some nuthead, uh, you know, jumps in with a weapon and starts threatening or using the weapon, which has happened so many times in theaters and other public places. But what if we made all public... Uh, places where people get together in a group would be under the umbrella of this field that will not allow the presence of weapons within it. That's that's the that we're standing at that edge right now. We are, and people are at the edge of accepting that, whereas they wouldn't have accepted it in the 70s. It'd be too much of an intrusion on their privacy and it. It wouldn't it'd be, it would, we wouldn't have the technology to start with, but we wouldn't have even thought of that type of technology back then. But now we have the capability of, of thinking about it and thinking along those lines of creating these protective fields around, um, you know, certain areas. Like it would be harm it's not even harmful. It would be so natural to say uh, a plus... You know, a negative field of carbon, meaning that if you had a, a field that would absorb this amount of carbon, if anybody walked through it, you know, humans have this much, and we're all a carbon-based thing, and all of a sudden this human has X amount of more carbon on them, say goodnight to that X amount of carbon. Well, Period. it would work on, um, instead of, like, the, the carbon in our body would be in the GANS state. But the carbon in the uh, bullet would be in the matter level state. So perhaps it would work on the carbon matter level and turn it into GANs, essentially. So um, it would also, would also be effective, get this, uh, any carbon particles lodged in our lungs that might cause cancer and so on, would also be dissolved in this field. It would turn it into GANs and our body would naturally deal with it and... Uh, so you you go through a healing chamber essentially as you entered into this room with other people, and it would also take care of any uh, matter level 
carbon in the bullets or other types of uh, you know someone had uh, explosives on them uh, explosive belt or one of these terrorist type things it would just dissolve it into GANs and they, they would stand there they'd be dripping <laughs> they'd have some stuff dripping out of their explosive belt and uh, and they would pull the trigger but nothing would happen and they'd just be embarrassed because they just uh, you know made a puddle on the floor in front of in, instead so maybe uh, yeah, I know you have to get ready for the, your session so let me just mm -hmm. end by saying this the little device that we're looking in front of us here that was my principal, my principal thought was that if we had a, a, a place for these different fields to be either created or gone to, Gantz is very smart. These plasma fields are so smart, they organize themselves in ways that we have no imagination. We, we're, we're only learning about what they do. But if we give them a, a place in order to organize themselves and start to do the things that they do best, that's where we're at at this point. That's what I've tried to create is a, a, a condition, like Mr. Cash says, once you create conditions for different things in plasma field technology, you might not exactly understand what you're doing. That's why he's taken us through these steps and baby steps. But all these things mat have a mat they matter to us because they're creating these fields like you said i might be creating a field right now that attracts x x x or i might be creating a field that uh disperses x x x or you might have created a field in XXX number of people out in the planet just by the the uh, description and visuals of this kind of object that we're looking at so that's another way to look at it so the effect goes out in many different dimensions other than the immediate space where this thing is in in, in front of you there it's affected me tonight talking about it um, you know sensing it and looking at it and and through you and so on it's affected my emotions my things I talk about and so on and all the other people here that are into this kind of thing <laughs> because we'll talk about it maybe we'll show the picture to someone else or mention it somewhere and so on all the connections are going out these threads go out and into all these different directions that we don't normally um, see or think about. Rick and everybody, do you remember Douglas when he went to the National Press Club in Washington and, and Mr. Kesh was invited via the video link to talk directly to the government officials? Mm -hmm. And I think the most important thing he, he was saying was that with a small ping pong ball full of GANs, <clears throat> plasma fields, floating in the ocean near the giant war fleet of aircraft carriers and destroyers and battleships, that that single ping pong ball could simply disarm like, and he gave the example of the Donald Cook, uh, you know, just like that just a simple little ball floating in the ocean and it created the necessary changes in the substances of the silicon chips and whatever else makes those battleships and planes and so on run. It changes them, like you said, Rick, into GANs rather than matter state and they don't work anymore on the matter level. And it's just as simple as that. And I think the message must have sunk in because, uh, you know, it, it's the, the seed was planted and I think there's a lot of talk going on in the background, you know, about the effects of this plasma technology, even though it's not in the public. I think everyone in the highest places really understands its checkmate to the, uh, the old big giant aircraft carriers and the big jets. And another interesting thing quickly, I, I just I don't even know why, but it came across my path. In the Russian uh, Moscow Air Show 2017, there was a, a, 
I think it was called an SU-10 um, plane, uh, military fighter plane, and it was breaking all the rules of avionics and physics and so on. It was flying, you know, as fast as any jet, and then all of a sudden it would stop, and then it would go up, and then it would do these rolls and flips and things and look like a helicopter uh, and had some kind of a motor in it that they didn't really tell the details of. But the, the way it was performing, everybody was uh, gobsmacked by this performance. Um, so we know the Russians have uh, had a little bit of a go at plasma technology and possibly they're building hybrids, you know, of aircraft with um, perhaps the help of plasma technology. Uh, just a hint they're giving to everybody that, you know, the old style is gone and the new is coming. And um, I just thought that was all interesting, the way these things are all happening at the moment. You, Rick, you wished for no diesel, no petrol. I just saw the headline, Volvo and, uh, and uh, Britain has just cancelled. They just said we're not having any more diesel or petrol engines, you know, in, a, in another few years. It's all gone. It's illegal. Stop it. Uh, you get on with electric or other technologies or you go out of business because you, we're already being sued. Massive uh, lawsuits are coming on board, like you've said in the past, yeah. from people who have suffered the consequences of diesel fumes sitting in traffic jams. The air is full of uh, lead and all sorts of crap. Yeah, from they haven't even started the health lawsuit yet, and already all these companies are in major doo-doo. Uh, Mercedes just had to recall over a million vehicles recently for diesel uh, problems and now they have to change those and Audi just is the latest one another 600,000 vehicles involved in and they are in big trouble with their uh, stuff goes back several years and uh, all the diesel uh, truck manufacturers are in trouble with it now in fact diesel's done diesel is totally we're so done with diesel on this planet it won't even be a second yeah, thought second. in a, a couple of years here. And that, to me, is such a major uh, relief from, from, my, uh, from, my, from everything for me. I'm so highly allergic to diesel, and many people are, and they don't even realize it, actually. The effects are subtle, and they can be very devastating. And uh, it's, uh, I'm just amazed that all, it's all sort of come together in the last couple of years where... The, the Volkswagen uh, fiasco, you know, came out where they were cheating on their emissions exams. And uh, it's totally uh, billions and billions of dollars and forced Volkswagen now to go to uh, electric vehicles. It's forced all the manufacturers to go that way, which they had in the wings anyway. They were developing electric vehicles. So now Volkswagen has an electric vehicle that will be competition for the Tesla, the cheapest Tesla car. It'll be the Volkswagen one will be cheaper, and there'll be competition there, and they'll be putting out millions of these things. And they'll also be trying to patch up their past reputation for with the diesel and all of the health effects and so on. When those lawsuits start kicking in, then these companies are going to want to start giving and giving and giving to the public. They're going to start giving away uh, vehicles to people to drive because of their uh, guilt that they feel for their past actions. In order to repair the past, they're going to have to, and, and in order to incur the favor of the public and not be totally torn apart and destroyed, they are going to have to really put out and that putting out means basically free transportation that's what they're going to be forced into and they'll find a way to pay for it through different ways you know advertising or whatever if, if they'll find ways but they they're going to be forced into that that's the the way of the future and i'm so happy and uh, this to me this is a, it's not just a small thing it I've had a thing for several years where I came to the conclusion uh, when you hear the term breath is essence, okay, and breath is essence, what does that mean? Breath is essence. Well, if you think about 
all the humans on this planet, that's what's been taken away from us, is our breath, in a way, our ability to just freely breathe without taking in all these toxic particles and different things that are happening and whatnot. It's hard, very, very difficult to get literally a breath of fresh air anywhere on this planet. I don't care if you're on the tallest mountain or the lowest valley, most lush valley in the world, it's still um, it's going to have uh, remnants of uh, these fields that we should not be inhaling because we're done with that now. And I'm so happy that that's trans transitioning and that to me means the essence is now bringing, bringing forth, being brought forth in the world and it's it rains number one and we're going to not put up with uh, things that interfere with that freeness that ability to breathe in in more than one way more way than one let's say okay i'm gonna your have to wrap things yes your wish is your, your command. wish is your command rick and uh, your command and and it's ours too and because of that that's why all this stuff's going on because we wished it into reality and now the material world is following just the way it should. It has no yep. choice because that's, that's our right. wish. That's right, exactly. And it may sound bizarre to some that, oh, they sound like a cult or whatever, but hey, anybody can have this wish for the benefit of others and it's really easy to activate once you get it going. It's just, you give from your soul. It's so simple, so straightforward so easy it's just that it's so simple and easy that it's like the purloin letter it was sitting there the whole time with all the secrets that they people needed to know and no one bothered to open it up and read it so anyway that's uh we're all uh, progressing very well right now i think it's an amazing time and we're all coming toward this uh the singularity as they say and it seems to be rapidly accelerating at this point and we are so fortunate every one of us to be at this time and place and position that we are in whatever that is right now because it's all perfect no matter where you are no matter how bad you think it is or how good you think it is it is a perfect position to be in right now and there's a uh, even better positions to be positioning into that's the thing about it is there's the choice points are coming up and the ability to move is much more fluid much more easy to move to make movement and go into higher levels where we we elevate our own uh, um, conditions and our own essential uh, beingness and elevate others more importantly so anyway it's a time where we push the elevator button and it's there's only the up button <laughs> so anyway i should start pushing the other button the off button here because i need to take a little break before the next uh, uh blueprint for peace teaching coming up in half an hour here i'd just like to say thank you rick uh, we've, uh, you and all of us have created the condition for change. And it's time for you to have a little break because we keep pushing the peace for change. It don't happen. It don't happen. It's happening now. It's, there's no stopping it. The, the lid yeah. is off. You know, we used to think that the lid was you know, we keep opening up the lid and looking inside, looking inside, hoping, hoping. But now the lid is so far open, I don't think that they can put it back on. Everybody's looking inside. There's too many people looking inside. And that's sometimes right. I think that's why Mr. Cash keeps wanting to say, oh, hold on, people, slow down. We've got a lot of people that got to be reacclimated to the situation. So it might seem foreign to a lot of outside of this group that are going to watch this video, that see what they've seen tonight, just absorb it. Don't, don't freak out over it. It's something that they should enjoy, and it's very easy because um, there will become a point where we'll be able to teach all of us to be able to do this. You know, we're just 
organi organizing ourselves now in order to teach more people to have the same feeling on and on and on so the teachers got to go now yeah and we get to uh, learn ourselves how to multiply that feeling and uh, multiply and divide it and give it out and take it in and all that it's uh, it's learning to be like uh, pipe fitters for uh, this fluid called love you know we're we're uh, all in this these rooms fitting pipes and attaching and making all the connections and learning how to work with this uh, this substance so thank you all very much for tonight's participation and uh, I like to call it to a close now and I'll see you again next week at the uh, Keshe Plasma Reactor Group. Alright, so I'll end the live stream.